Okay, I welcome you to our first rather spontaneous scientific discussion here on our YouTube channel. We are guests at Dr. Norbert Schwarzer, founder and head of the Saxonian Institute of Surface Mechanics, based on the beautiful German island Rügen. Hello Norbert. Hello Peggy. You have written several hundreds of papers within the last three years. And this year, Penn Stanford Publishing is bringing out two major books onto the market with big titles such as The Word Formula and The Theory of Everything. Why do you think that you have found a theory of everything? Rather spontaneous. Great. Uh, this first question is missing something. It's the rest of the titles from those two books you just mentioned. The first book, Theory of Everything, uh, ends with a Fermat's universe. So there is a man being named, which is called Fermat, Pierre de Fermat. He lived in the 17th century and had uh, a famous, a very famous uh, theorem called the last, uh, famous Fermat's last theorem. And it's a very important one because it tells us what the universe can do when in the smallest parts of itself, it just consists of whole things. Because this restricts its mathematical operations and all its operations it can do with them things. So uh, here is one important figure in history which already has done something. And the next question, uh, or the next part of the question with the other book, the world formula. Here you've missed uh, the title part which says, um, a late recognition to David Hilbert, or David Hilbert's uh, stroke of genius, um, because he is uh, the one who originally found the world formula. Only that, well, obviously, uh, scientists all around the world haven't seen this for 105 years, because it was in 1915 even before uh, Einstein published his famous paper on general uh, theory of relativity, where Hilbert already published this equation. But at the time, quantum mechanics was not um, so large and so well known as it is nowadays. Uh, the Schrodinger equation came 1920, the Dirac equation 29 or something. So um, people had no real um, motivation to see the uh, Hilbert equation as something which contains it all. And well, let me show you. But I think this question was asked in this way on purpose to humble me a little bit <laughs> and force me to tell the audience that it's not I who found the world formula and the theory of everything. Others found it, uh, had found it for me, before me, and I think uh, I just uh, put it all together. That so. sounds very humble. Well, no, it's the truth. <laughs> the truth. <laughs> okay. Um, the word formula, as we can write it down, is uh, great. Well, you see, spontaneous. Uh, you write it like this. You sum up over everything which can do something, this something has been called curvature, and there's a little bit more, but we stop it here. In a certain given volume, let's take this volume to be the whole universe, or a huge system you want to consider, and sum it all up. You put this on an integral, and then you variate with respect to certain things, and set this to zero. This just means that you always try to find a minimum. This seems to be an extremely principal thing, a fundamental rule for the whole universe. Because if you extract the theory and look at it closely, you always find that it somehow uh, belongs to, to a minimum principle. So the minimum principle seems to be a fundamental thing in this universe. And what you put here um, is not really of importance. You have to consider all variations, while Hilbert just looked for the variation of the 
thing we call the metric, which gives a structure of space-time. So uh, if you make this more general, you have a world formula which brings quantum theory and general theory of relativity, Einstein, Schrödinger, uh, Dirac, Born, uh, Bohr, etc. Um, together. And this is, a th the, the, this is what people usually call a theory of everything because bringing general theory of relativity, which is gravity and stuff and big things, and quantum theory, which is small things, atoms, elementary particles, together contains it all. And if you look closely, we also see that this, is, this contains thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, and evolutional forces. So this is really everything. But it was found by somebody else, not us. We just put it all together. Okay, that sounds interesting. And uh, in your latest post on LinkedIn, you mentioned also connections or applications of this theory with things like love, belief, hope. Um, can you tell us more about this? Yes and no. We start with a no. Uh, belief is definitely something which uh, comes in due course, which means during the evolution of the universe, when the universe started to experiment with uh, bigger brains, it had to introduce belief. Otherwise, otherwise within the uh, Darwin sense of the survival of the fittest, those smarter entities would not have been fitter than the rest. So uh, dimness pays off in some cases. <laughs> uh, evolution had to solve this, and this is very clever of the evolution because it used the same um, thing which caused the problem, namely the bigger brains, to, 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 to get rid of the problem by introducing something into it. This is belief. But this, this is not a fundamental prop, uh, principle, it is just coming out of the evolution process. But um, it, in order to explain it properly, we have to extract evolution from the world formula first, which is a rather uh, cumbersome process, and then from there we extract the evolution, evolutionary process for the development of bigger brains, and uh, from there then we will see that only with certain spiritual properties where the individual can uh, put things it is not able to understand immediately into a cupboard and say, oh, this is a higher entity taking care about it. this is the God or something, otherwise it would not be able to survive the problematic um, antagonism between having an internal force to try and understand everything and not being able to understi understand this uh, certain, perhaps very important thing, like the death of a partner or something, or own children. Uh, next one was hope, right? And yes. love? Yeah. Okay, hope is a, is a bit more principle, because when you try to write this down in the usual mathematical way, you very often encounter extremely difficult nonlinear equations. This is always every mathematici mathematician understands uh, nonlinear differential equations is a horrible thing. And from here, uh, look at the Einstein field equations, things come out which are really, really, really difficult. Um, and, but, but by looking closely at it, uh, nah, closely is the wrong word, moving a bit further away from the problem, you suddenly see, looking at the whole and a bit more, you suddenly see that you can get rid of the nonlinearity by introducing more degrees of freedom. This sounds making the problem more complicated, adding more dimensions. But the mathematical structure suddenly stretches out, the thing becomes linear. Mm -hmm. And so no matter how complicated a problem looks when being written down on first attempt, in the world formula most principal structure. You can always simplify it 
by moving a bit away, looking at it more holistically, making the blowing the problem a bit up, making it a bit bigger, introducing the right additional properties, linearizing it, it that way, and then it becomes simpler. This is just hope. This is just hope. There's always a way. You sometimes simply need to detach yourself from this very much unsolvable problem and then you'll often see a way to still solve it. And love? Yeah, well, we start with the definition of love. Many think, many people think, it's just the trial for the closest interaction. Come as close as possible together, this is true love. No, this is totally wrong. This would be equal to an interaction, let be this a potential, and let be this uh, the distance that falling into a black hole would be the way you can define love. That's total rubbish. No, true love is, uh, let's take two entities being in love with each other, uh, is providing each other a comfort zone of space. Uh, in fact, it's space-time. A comfort zone of space-time. This is described by such an interaction. Where you he here you have your comfort zone, where you can smoothly move, have your degrees of freedom, and still belong together. You provide this zone for your partner, your pro partner provides this zone for you. And if both have, are acting in the same interactional field, they will be very happy with each other. So, this is what I call the ideal love interaction. And the thing is, in our universe, this kind of interaction is dominant. Even gravity, when being evaluated with quantum theory or combined with quantum theory in this way here, extracted properly with all the degrees of freedom taken into account from the world formula, you find that it has this type of interaction. So there's attraction, where things are pulled together, and from a certain distance onwards, there's repulsion, leading to a zone of comfort mm -hmm. for each individual, for each being, for particles, for whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds so interesting. No black holes. That's the opposite of love. Okay, and you also said that the theory of everything gives a clear definition of the absolute good. How can we understand this? Ah, well, you can call me well prepared because I have already made this little sketch here. Uh, as I just said, um, we are living in a universe where one principle is the minimum principle. That everything tries to settle comfortly in a valley like a ball falling down, rolling down the hill, then it settles somewhere <laughs> here. Now, of course, uh, there can be quite complicated terrains, which means it can be here or there. Uh, it can be also up there, meaning this is, this is a local minimum. This is not the optimum. But taking the definition of good and trying to, to find an, uh, a minimum principle for good, then the simplest definition is just it has to be a minimum. And what would this minimum be? It's the minimum of suffering. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So holistically considering a system in which you want to have something good to happen, you have to consider it all. No ideology. Consider it all. Switch off ideology. This makes you get wrong. And go for the minimum of suffering for everything and all in this very system. Then you have your optimum good. Mm -hmm. And how about the evil then? Should it just be the opposite of good or in your words the maximum of suffering? <laughs> This would mean that evil cannot truly or stable exist in our universe because the maximum of something is not stable. The smallest perturbation and the thing mm. rolls down the hill. Yeah. 
So evil cannot exist. Ah, it's simple. Yeah. <laughs> we have a good universe. Yeah. Good message. Totally wrong. It's totally wrong. Evil is not the opposite of good. For us, not seeing everything, uh, it's hard, it's good to define it like this, but it's wrong. Evil is purposefully avoiding to truly look, to holistically look at the system with all its degrees of freedom and avoiding certain questions and trying to settle comfortably where it suits best those who make the decisions. Mm. Sounds familiar, what? Typical mm. for politicians. They settle here and define this is the optimum good. Because they cut off all this information. Yeah. They just watch half of the information. This is ideology. <coughs> Self-interested, dominated ideology. You find it everywhere. And so the opposite of good is not necessarily evil. It is, evil is something else. Evil is purposefully avoiding the truth, the full truth. That sounds very interesting and we could talk about it much longer, but uh, time's running out here a little bit. So I come to my last question for here and now. Is, there is uh, quite some interest in the field of artificial intelligence about the creation of consciousness, is there not? What does your theory tell us about that? Well, there's a great interest since the Terminator, right? <laughs> yeah, for example. Yeah, when the uh, Skylab awakes or what was this? Yeah. So uh, it is um, an interesting question. And I think that in order to have consciousness, you have first have to have a, a metric um, understanding of reality. And then you have to have a metric understanding of yourself. And these two matrix understandings, which could be in, in one matrix, which could be brought into one matrix, need to be entangled. They need to be combined. The one needs to be able to see itself in the other. Mm -hmm. Then you have a conscious understanding of yourself within your environment. That is very important. And in, in quantum mechanics, we call this combination just entanglement. So mathematically, it's clear how to formulate itself. And why metric? Because what universe has had at hand all the time, whether it was from the right beginning in the Big Bang or during the evolution of time we had on Earth with all the biological uh, species and everything, it was matrix. Nowadays, artificial intelligence is based on linear algebra. I do not know when universe ever used linear algebra. No. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a wrong path. It's oh, a dead okay. end. Linear algebra is a dead end. Artificial intelligence will distinguish itself from true intelligence as long as they stick to this dead end. Wow, yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for the interesting discussion. I think there is a lot of potential in your theory and we should definitely go for another talk someday soon. Maybe we can arrange this. So, but goodbye for today. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.